Last week Saturday, the Palestinian group Hamas launched an all-out offensive on Israel. In response, Israel declared a full-scale war against Palestine and Hamas. This is an age-long conflict that is wrapped in faith and nationalism. At the core of it is the Israeli occupation of areas considered to be holy sites by the Palestinians. Many have tried to resolve this conflict, including the United Nations. In fact, a resolution for Israel to yield the control of this holy site to Palestine was presented before the UN Security Council in 2014. Palestine needed 9 out of 15 votes for this resolution to be passed. It only got 8. Guess who chickened out at the last minute? Nigeria. We abstained from voting, so the resolution failed and the Israeli occupation of Palestine continued. Why did we decide not to vote? And is it possible that that vote could have changed the state of this conflict forever? It's complex, but let's take a look at the gray areas. Now, this is a very important and sensitive topic for me to discuss. And I mean that as a Nigerian and then as a Muslim. First, as a Nigerian, when news of the renewed conflict between Israel and Palestine broke out last Saturday, the federal government of Nigeria issued a statement expressing deep concern about what they described as the outbreak of hostilities. Nigeria's Foreign Affairs Minister, Ambassador Yusuf Tugar, in a statement personally signed by him, called for de-escalation and ceasefire. Well, that seems like what any other country would have said. But you see, whether directly or indirectly, Nigeria played a key role in the perpetuation of armed conflict between Israel and Palestine. And I'll tell you why, but you have to understand the backstory first. You see, the root of this conflict between Israel and Palestine is very deep and complex. Between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea is a geographic landscape where two nationalities and three different religions lay claim to. Palestinians and Israelis say this territory belongs to us. Meanwhile, Christians, Muslims, and Jews also have different sacred connections to the only sites across the region. So it is not surprising that there were frequent agitation for maximum control of this region by the Arabs and the Jews. Several wars have been fought over the control of this region, but things always get worse. As World War I began, the world powers at the time tried to shape the map of modern Middle East and West Asia to strike alliances and suit their interests. Several contradictory promises were made by Britain to different ethnic and religious nationality. So what they do is they go to the Arabs and say, oh, support us and we'll grant you an independent Arab state in Palestine. Then again, they go to the Jews and say, join forces with us and you will get a national home for the Jews. For the Palestinians, their claim to an independent Arab state in the region is often cited in a series of letters between the Sheriff of Mecca, Hussein bin Hali, and the British High Commissioner in Egypt, Sir Henry McMahon, between 1915 and 1916. They say in this correspondence, Britain made a promise of an independent Arab state in the region known as Palestine. Meanwhile, almost at the same time in 1917, Britain's Foreign Secretary, Lord Arthur Balfour, wrote a letter to this man, Mr. Leonard Walter. He is the head of an influential British Jewish community. In that letter, which is now known as the Balfour Declaration, Lord Balfour expressed the support of the British government for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. This is nothing short of a double dealing. In essence, what happened is an European power promised the Zionist movement a country where Palestinian Arab natives made up more than 90% of the population. This is like adding gunpowder to fire. An explosion is imminent. The British also facilitated mass Jewish immigration into Palestinian territory. Most of them were fleeing from the Nazi persecution of Jews led by Adolf Hitler in Germany. In no time, the population ratio was upscaled for the Jewish settlers. With this, both sides intensified their assertion of right to establish a country in the same space. For the Arabs, this is Palestine. For the Jews, this is Israel. By the end of World War II, the right to statehood by both sides remained fierce and intense. So in 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed what is called the Resolution 181. With this arrangement, the region is to be partitioned into two equal and independent states, one Arab, and one Jewish. 
The Palestinians rejected the plan, and here is why. The plan allotted about 55% of Palestinian territory, including most of the Fatah coastal region, to the Jewish state, which has only 33% of the population. At that time, the Palestinians made up 67% of the population, but with the UN arrangement, they will now have 42% of the region, and the remaining 3% will be the city of Jerusalem, which will now be under international administration. That's why the Palestinians rejected this. But for Israel, this was a deal well done. So in between this disagreement, Israel went ahead to declare statehood in 1948. It captured 78% of historic Palestinian territory. The remaining 22% was divided into what is now known as the Occupied West Bank and the Gaza Strip. In the end, Israel gains control of an even larger portion of the territory. An estimated 700,000 Palestinians have to flee or are driven out of their land in what Palestinians refer to as the Nakba or catastrophe. This would mark the beginning of several Arab-Israeli wars and uprisings within the past seven decades. The first of these wars was fought in 1948. The Six-Day War would follow in 1967, and then the Yom Kippur War, which actually happened exactly 50 years ago in October 1973. Other uprisings include the First Intifada of 1897 and the Second Intifada of the year 2000. Israel won a lot of these wars, and with every win, they take more Palestinian territory for themselves, while further enraging the Palestinians and their allies. Take for example, after the June 1967 war, Israel took control of Palestinian territories, including the Gaza Strip, the city of Sinai, the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and more importantly, East Jerusalem. And this is very key to this conflict. At the heart of this conflict is the battle for the soul of the city of Jerusalem. This city is very, very important. In fact, experts say that without the city of Jerusalem, this conflict might have been easier to resolve. Each side might just have to carve out the entire stretch of space into two separate geographic units that they can own and govern with no encroachment into each other's territory. But the problem till today lies in their collective and unequivocal claim to the city of Jerusalem. This city is important for the adherence of the three Abrahamic faiths, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And this is how important it is. For Christians, all of the New Testament takes place in the land of Israel, and Jerusalem specifically is associated with major events in the life of Jesus Christ. Among the most important Christian sites in Jerusalem, there is the Mount of Olives, where churches mark various events in Jesus' life, including the site where he taught the Lord's Prayer, the places where he looked out across Jerusalem and wept. There is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed and was arrested on the eve of his crucifixion. In the old city of Jerusalem is the Via Dolorosa. It is a route through the narrow lanes where Jesus walked on his way to the Calvary. At the end of the Val Dolorosa route is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This massive 4th century church holds many chapels and the tomb of Jesus. Other sites that make Jerusalem a holy city for Christians are the Room of the Last Supper, the Chapel of Ascension, where Jesus ascended to heaven. So this is an important city in Christianity. For Jews, Jerusalem is the spiritual and ancestral art of Judaism and has been so since the 10th century BC. The city features prominently in the Old Testament. In fact, it is said that Jerusalem is mentioned a total of 669 times in the Old Testament. And Zion, which is another name for the city, is mentioned 154 times. The Jewish holy book, the Torah, tells how the first temple was built in the 10th century BC and then destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BC. Then the second temple was built in its place in the 6th century BC, only to be destroyed by the Romans later on. These references make Jerusalem as special significance in the Jewish faith. Up until today, Jews pray at the Western Wall, the only surviving part of the temple structure, and it is considered the earliest Jewish site in the world. Meanwhile, for Muslims, it's the same case too. In East Jerusalem, there's a place called the Old City. It has this huge compound that houses a sanctuary. That's where the Jews call Temple Mount. The Muslims call it Al Haram Al Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary, or Masjid Al Aqsa. Now, right in the middle of everything is the Dome of the Rock, is the third holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. In Islam, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went on a mystical trip to heaven 
It's called al Isroi wa Miraj in 621 AD. And he ascended to heaven right from this dome. In fact, before the Kaaba in Mecca, Muslims prayed facing the direction of Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. That's how sacred it is in Islam too. Put all of this together, you have a perfect recipe for a conflict. For a long time now, the situation at this holy site was such that Muslims would pray in Masjid al-Aqsa, Christians could visit the Temple Mount, and for Jews, traditionally they are actually forbidden to enter the Temple Mount due to how holy and divine they consider it to be. They can only pray at the Western Wall. So they do pray at the Western Wall there. But all of this would change in 1967. That was when Israel won the six-day war and seized control of the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. They took control of all of this city, but when it came to Al-Aqsa compound, there was an agreement. It's called the status quo. I'll let this man, Daniel Sederman, explain. He's a lawyer and the founder of Terrestrial Jerusalem. Very simple. Muslims pray, non-Muslims visit. Full stop. If I were to try and translate this into the description of a dynamic, um, the Holy Esplanade Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount is exclusively a place of worship for Muslims that is open to the dignified and respectful visits of non-Muslims and in coordination with the autonomous authorities of the Waqf. Okay, that's in theory. In reality, what actually happens is that with Israel's occupation of East Jerusalem, they have a heavy military presence there, including at the gate of Al-Aqsa compound. So they literally decide who is allowed in and who is not. And this often results into tension between armed Israeli security officials and the Palestinian Muslims. This wasn't always so apparent, but in Israel, things were changing rapidly. Moderate politicians were giving way for far-right ideological Zionists who want absolute control of Palestinian territories and the Al-Aqsa compound. Remember, the Jewish faith forbids Jews from entering the Temple Mount, but this man, Ariel Sharon, who was a member of the opposition then, broke that rule. In a provocative attempt, he entered the compound and urged many more Jews to do the same. Protests strung up across the region. It was called the Second Intifada. It started in the year 2000. It didn't end until 2005. And it saw hundreds of people dying in clashes between the Israeli security forces and Palestinian protesters. And guess what? This man went on to become the Prime Minister of Israel. With far-right groups in power, Israel will go on to exercise a lot more control on Palestinian territories. It has been accused of breaking agreed conventions of the status quo. So there are lots of ways that the status quo has been violated. Restrictions uh, on Muslim worship, which is something that the Israeli occupation imposes uh, quite frequently. Sometimes age restrictions, usually limiting men of a certain age from entering the site if they feel that there may be protests or, or something happening. We're also seeing um, more Jewish prayer, whether it's silent, but slowly it's becoming much more overt now. There is Jewish prayer. I've seen it daily. Uh, but beyond that, there is a triumphalism, an ultra-national triumphalism, which is perceived as a violation of the sanctity of the site by Muslim worshippers and people in the Muslim world. So at the backdrop of all of this is the growing power of far-right ideological groups and religious hardliners in Israel. But in between these conflicts, there has also been times where glimmers of hope towards peaceful resolution, particularly Israel's demilitarization of this holy site, surfaces. The brightest of such glimmers of hope happened in 2014. And that's where the key role that Nigeria played in this conflict was identified. The United Nations Security Council was presented with a resolution to end Israeli occupation of some of these holy sites, including the Al-Aqsa compound, and then yield the control to Palestine as soon as 2015 or as late as 2017. The resolution also sought full membership of the United Nations for Palestine. 
This is the biggest attempt towards relative peace and normalization between Israel and Palestine. Of course, Israel does not want it, but Palestine does. And it needed just to have 9 out of 15 votes in order to have that resolution passed at the United Nations. Somehow, Palestine was sure that it would get Nigeria's vote. I mean, both countries are tied together by being members of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. In fact, reports say there were diplomatic assurances that Nigeria would vote for Palestine and against Israel. But guess what? Out of the nine votes needed, Palestine got eight votes, with Nigeria backing out at the last minute and deciding to abstain from voting for or against the resolution. President Goodluck Jonathan was in office at the time. He's a Christian, but he came to power with significant backing from Nigeria's Muslim majority north. Observer says he decided to abstain from voting for two reasons. One, his personal religious ties with Israel as a Christian. In fact, he was the first Nigerian president to ever visit Israel. And secondly, he didn't make Nigeria vote against Palestine so as not to upset the Muslim majority backing that he has from the north. So abstaining from voting seems like the only politically correct calculative move to take. Although this move might just be a simple political move by the Nigerian president, but for Palestine, the effect of the lack of that one vote from Nigeria would spell the furtherance of Israeli occupation in Palestine and the continuation of decades-old conflict that is shrouded in as much faith as nationalism. Since last Saturday when Hamas struck Israel and Israeli forces retaliated, it's been absolute bloodbath, running into the loss of thousands of lives, particularly of civilians. By the time you are watching this, the death toll will be much higher. It makes one wonder, what if Nigeria had voted for Palestine and against Israeli occupation of those holy sites in that 2014 UN resolution? Would a series of conflicts that has ensued since then still persist? This includes the killing of 170 protesters by Israeli forces in 2018, the Israeli police raid of Al-Aqsa Mosque, which left more than 200 people dead in Gaza in 2021, the Israeli break the wave military operation in the West Bank, which killed more than 146 people in 2022, and the expansion of settlement activities in occupied Palestinian territories. Could all of this have been avoided if Nigeria voted for Palestine and against Israeli occupation. I guess we will never know. What we do know for sure is that peace is needed in this region because right now, the situation is far from peaceful.